Amen. Amen. Well, guys, great to be with you this morning um, and brilliant to be in this amazing story. You know, I do think that this is just one of the best stories in scripture um, in Luke 15, the story of the prodigal son, man. And so I'm, I think I'm just going to start by reading it again, if that's okay, because I think it's, a, it's such a great story. I just want to share it with you again. So let me read this. If you've got a Bible, you might want to get that open in front of you. We'll probably have it on the screen as well. Um, but yeah, let's just allow this story to speak words of life over us this morning. Um, you've probably heard this story many times before. If you haven't, you're in for a treat, although you've just seen it on the kids' video. Um, but let's be, let's be sharing this post as well. This is such an evangelistic story um, that we want the world to know. God's love will never stop chasing after you. Let me read it. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he'd spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself to a citizen of that country who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. And he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, but make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and bring the cat and calf and, calf and kill it. And let's have a feast and celebrate for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what was going on. Your brother has come home, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he's back home safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been um, with you, father, uh, slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me. And everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He is lost and is found. Wow, what a story. What a story. You know, I think as you read that story, what you kind of see there is two young men, two sons, both in a crisis moment in their life, in two very different ways, but I think actually connected for the same sorts of reasons and I don't know how you're doing this morning, as you're tuning in and watching this, how you're coping, how you're feeling in the midst of this pandemic. For me, it feels like every day is Groundhog Day. I don't know if you feel like that. I joke to Alicia, I'm like, what should we do for this weekend? Shall we go for a walk? Yes, we'll go for a walk again, because that's literally the only thing that we can do. Um, and I, I don't know, I, I'm starting to feel really quite tired. Um, I, I don't know about you, but I'm surprised at how tired I felt, mainly because I'm not actually doing it. Well, in some ways, I'm not actually doing that much. I'm just kind of sat at my desk all day. I've gone for the odd walk with somebody uh, when I can, but that's kind of all I've been able to do. My Meanwhile, Alicia's been like, you know, slaving away at school, actually doing some hard work. And I'm like, but why am I so tired at the end of every day and feeling quite exhausted? I don't know if that's been your experience as well. Let me know in the comments. Please tell us how you are feeling in the comments. Are you feeling tired as well? 
I think there's almost like um, the, just the, the emotional drain of being in this period just takes its toll after a little while. And, uh, and, and just because the only way to connect with people is online, it feels like we're just you know, constantly connected in this place with notifications and messages and you know, there's stuff on social media going on. And, and the, all of this over a while starts to kind of, I, I think, almost wear you out and tie you down um, to this point. I, I think sometimes even to this point of, of almost desperation and exhaustion and burnout and crisis like these two sons in this story get to. So I do think that's the point they get to. And they get to this point of exhaustion and crisis and burnout and desperation for two different reasons. The first son, because he runs ahead of what God is already doing. And the second son, because he fails to keep up with what God is doing. But I want to say to you this morning that there is a place to do life where you escape from that exhaustion and that tiredness and that crisis and that burnout by not running ahead of what God is doing, nor by falling behind with what God is doing, but by keeping in step with the Spirit. By staying in the Father's presence. And when you do that in your life, that is the place where you find you can best live life. So let me tell you this story again. Let's go through this. Um, And let's pick up some of the backstory here. And let's see how this whole thing unravels. So the story starts with a rich father. Okay, I'm going to read some detail into the story that I think is there when you read the rest of the Bible. And so this is context, okay? The Bible, the story doesn't explicitly tell us this, but I think this father is wealthy, okay? He's got a triple garage with three cars in it. He's got ensuite bathrooms on his ensuite bathroom. He has got everything as well that his two sons would ever want. He's got quad bikes, mountain bikes, quad bikes. I said quad bikes, every type of bike you could ever imagine. He's got tree houses, and these sons have the best time with their dad. They're going camping, they're going fishing, they're having like the best time ever. But the, but the best thing of all is not the kind of riches of this father who has everything, of which there are many riches, and the sons love it and the sons enjoy it. Actually, the best thing about living with this father is not his riches, but the father himself. It's the way that he, and I guess so many of us have had negative experience with our fathers, distant fathers, abusive fathers, fathers that just weren't there. But this father is both incredibly wealthy and incredibly present. He loves his sons. He nurtures them. He teaches them. He raises them. He helps them to to grow up. And this father, it's like he has a dream for the future for these two sons. And I think this is what we see throughout the scriptures in our Heavenly Father. He has a dream for the future where his two sons grow up with him and they become co-heirs, inheritors of the estate with the father. And then once they've grown up, they do life together where they are ruling over the estate and ruling over the gardens of this great house together as partners and that's what this God this father imagines he imagines them you know, in the future when they're old and they're fishing and they're camping and they're cooking and they're maintaining the gardens they're ruling over this wonderful creation together and there's riches like you've never imagined but most importantly the presence of the father is there with them and they the two sons they walk with the father in the cool of the day And they just have conversation. And they just spend time with each other. And it is the most beautiful thing you could ever imagine. But the problem is, is that the younger son makes a very subtle but important mistake. He sees that the father wants him to have everything. And he can't believe it. This is amazing. Dad, do you want me to have all this stuff? Like the Lamborghini and the triple garage is mine. I can't believe you want this amazing inheritance for, for it all to be mine. And so he says, I want it now. Why would I want it? I want it now. And he makes this mistake where he elevates the gifts above the giver. Because the gifts are wonderful. and Don't get me wrong, the gifts are amazing. But he starts to elevate them above the giver. Now, I want to suggest this is exactly what we do in our lives. Because just like the son knew that the father wanted to give him everything, you and I also know that we're destined for something more, don't we? Like the Bible says in Ecclesiastes that God has set eternity in the hearts of men. And I believe that every human being, regardless of your religion, belief, belief, 
or background, we all know innately that we're made for something more, that we're made to be with the Father and we're made to enjoy his riches. And that is why we despise poverty, we despise injustice, and we long for a world that is better. Like the reason why many of us have often thought about what we would do if we won the lottery, even though we don't play the lottery, is because we were made to be rich. You read the end of the Bible, the streets in Revelation are paved with gold. They're paved with gold. Poverty is not supposed to be part of the picture. And so the sun is right. We are destined for more. We're destined for riches. But just like the sun, we so often make the same mistake and we elevate gifts above giver. And it doesn't go well. The son comes to the father. He says, I want it now. I see, Lord, Father, what you're doing in my life. I want it now. And so he takes it, but he, he ends up with his life falling apart because I guess almost the best way to explain it is, I was thinking about this this morning, it's a bit like a fountain. And the reason why being with the father is so amazing and so full of riches is because he's the fountain of life. And all those riches and all those gifts overflow from him. And it's like you see that fountain and you're like, oh, the water is so good. It's so beautiful. It's so clear. It's so cold. It's so refreshing. I want it now. And so you fill up a bucket and you take it away with you, smiling because you think, oh, I've got some of the water. When all the time, the mistake was that the best thing, obviously, was the fountain itself, the source of life. And once you've drunk that water, it's gone. And you can't get any more. Whereas with, when you're with the Father and you stay with him, you can drink forever. That's the mistake the son makes. And it's interesting, the word there used for inheritance in the Greek is um, bios. And bios is where we get our word biology. It means life. And so as the son comes to the Father and asks for inher- his inheritance, he's like he's saying, I want some of your life. Your life. And so do you see the problem there? It is like the fountain. You know, the son is taking some of the father's life for himself, separating it out from the father. And it's like he's then using it all up, all these riches. But because he's made that mistake of separating it from the father, eventually they run out. Because it's not the thing that we find satisfaction in. It's just a product of the thing that we find satisfaction in. It's a substance. And so it ends up being like the son is trying to drive his car without putting any fuel in it. The car is great, but it's not going anywhere because it's not connected to the source of life that was the provider of that thing in the first place. And so the father ends up in a real dilemma. He's like, what am I going to do? My son's come to me. He he wants all this stuff. I know that if he takes it, it's going to end in ruin because he's, he's taking life but separated from the source of life. He's taking riches but separated from the source of riches. One day it's going to run out and it's going to end in ruin and end in crisis. But if I force him to stay, then he stays. But he stays also not connected to the source of life and the source of riches because he doesn't stay as a son. He stays as a robot. He stays as a slave. He stays as someone who's been forced to stay. And the thing about it is that if you are to have access to the source of life and to the source of riches and to the thing where all good things come from, then the way that you access that is through relationship. And so the father has no choice. If he makes him stay, the relationship is ruined. If he lets him go, the relationship is ruined. Except if he lets him go, maybe, just maybe, Just maybe he'll change his mind and he'll make the choice to come back home. And I think this is so often the place where we end up in our lives. We elevate gifts above giver. We take the good things that God has given us. We live for them without him. And we end up getting exhausted and tired and burnt out. Restless hearts are supposed to find their rest in him. He is the place where we find satisfaction and goodness and something worth living for. But when we take those gifts away and we live for them now, we get into trouble. You think about, I don't know how it works for you. Maybe it is that over the last few months of lockdown, your Amazon delivery driver has looked more and more ripped every time 
He hauls all these Amazon parcels into your house, okay? And you keep thinking, okay, one more shopping spree online and I'll be satisfied. One more shopping spree online and then I'll have enough gifts in order to satisfy me. But you've made a tragic mistake because you've elevated gifts above giver and so it never satisfies and it never works out. And you go down that line for long enough and all of a sudden your bank account's in the red, your credit cards are maxed up and you reach crisis point and it still hasn't worked. For others of us, it's like uh, uh, more of like a desire to want to please people and and fulfill other people's expectations of us. And we think when we can walk into other people's expectations of us, then it's like this this gift that's given to us and it's going to fulfill us and it's going to make everything right. And so you end up in this moment where you're hyper-connected, you're answering every message within 30 seconds, you're always on your emails, you're checking your messages all the time. Uh, But eventually, you can never do enough. You can never do enough to kind of bring that kind of satisfaction and fulfillment in your life. It's like you're, you're elevating gifts above giver. Well, restless hearts are supposed to find their rest in him. There's a reason why it doesn't work. For others, it's like a hobby or a business project or a house project. And you're like, oh, you know, and you throw yourself into it. You spend the money on it. You invest in it. You buy all the stuff. You join the online forums. And like, you know how it goes. And then, and then after a time... It, it, the, the house falls, th- you know, house exchange falls through, or the business plan doesn't work out, or the, or the money runs out, or something breaks, and then it doesn't work out how it's supposed to work out, and, and you're devastated, you're at crisis point, you're exhausted, you're burnt out, where you've elevated gifts above giver, and restless hearts don't find their rest in anything other than in Him. You're taking the water out the fountain, trying to drink it, thinking it's going to satisfy you and quench your thirst, and now it's empty and it's all gone. You need to go back to the fountain. Back to the source of riches, to the source of life. I think in many ways in Europe, as a continent, this is what we've done. We've spent years, decades, centuries, building kingdoms and empires, economies and structures. We've built the kingdom without the king. We've done progress without his presence for so long. And now, guess what? We've reached crisis point. There's a global pandemic. Everything is falling apart. The economy's in ruins. Everybody's losing their jobs. Unemployment, mental health, domestic violence. It's getting worse and worse. We're at crisis point because we've been trying to go on for so long without him, operating in his, in his gifts without him, that we've failed to find rest and satisfaction and the things that fulfill and give life real meaning. We've done the kingdom without the king. We've done progress without his presence. And look where it has got us. And so the son ends up, the younger son ends up at this crisis moment where, you know, it's like he goes to the bank with his bank card and it's like card declined, card declined, card declined. The money has run out. He ends up feeding the pigs, which we know in a Jewish context was like the most shameful thing that he could ever be doing. And and I just want to ask some of you this morning, uh, do you need to recognize that maybe this is the point that you are at? Or at least this is the path that you are on, where you've been elevating gifts above giver, trying to almost run ahead of what God is doing. Because God is doing this stuff in the fullness of time, but it's now and not yet. And until then, you have to trust him and know him and not run ahead of what he's doing and try and build the kingdom now in your own strength. Because if you do, it will fail and it will leave you miserable. And so, yeah, I don't know. Ask yourself the question. I think sometimes we've always assumed the story of the prodigal son was about people that were like dealt drugs or killed somebody or did something insanely terrible. But actually, the prodigal son is the story of all of us because we've all done that. I've been doing that this last week. I did it this morning on the way here. You know, I'm always running ahead trying to do stuff in my own strength rather than coming back and finding rest in him. But I think what we see in this story is that that is only one way to have a crisis in your life. There's another way to have a crisis as well. And that's the crisis that the older son ends up in. And the crisis the older son ends up in is is in some ways the same. In some ways it's very different. And the way I imagine it is this. He grew up in the same environment. Seeing all the father's riches, being, spending time with, and he had all these memories when he was younger, spending time with a father, you know, camping trips, fishing, they were spending time together, they were doing loads of stuff together. But then he sees the, the younger son run away with all the stuff, and he thinks, oh, I'm not going to do that, I'm going to stay with the father. But at some point, something happens. 
At some point, he too starts to elevate gift above giver. At some point, he too decides to do kingdom without the king. And we see that because when there is the party at the end, the older son is outside and he's like, hang on, this isn't fair. I don't really care about what's on your heart, father. I just want you to give me my stuff. And you see, he ends up at exactly the same point. He doesn't care about relationship with the father. He's, he's, something has gone cold. Like over time, something has happened in that relationship and it has gone cold. And although the son has been living in the father's house, they're not really relating to each other anymore. And I think this is so easy to do, you know? As Christians, right, you, you might, obviously you don't come to the building anymore, but you might sort of come here metaphorically, week in, week out, week in, week out. And, and uh, you're actually, in a way, you're just clinging on to memories of something God did in the past when you were younger. You're not here now, you're still experiencing him in a vital, vibrant relationship. You're just clinging on to stuff that he did in the past. You know, ask yourself the honest and difficult question. Because we've all got stories about stuff God did in our past, you know. Great times when he answered prayer or a time when you really knew him or a time when you really saw him move. But how long ago was your last good story? Was it last week? Was it last month? Was it 10 years ago? 20 years ago? Because sometimes and often it's sometimes it's when we come to faith, we have an amazing experience of God in our lives and it's vibrant and it's exciting and he's there and he's with us. But then over time, it seems to fade and go cold. And that's why it's like God moves on ahead of us and we fail to keep up. And so because we fail to keep up, we want to make up that gap by like, putting stuff in, you know, sort of systems and structures to make sure that we're kind of like doing the right things. You know, we come to the building every Sunday because we want to try and maintain the motions to make it feel like everything is okay, even though it's not okay. And this can happen to churches as well and, you know, even whole movements. God moved powerfully 10 years ago. And so we want to maintain that. We still sing the same songs from 10 years ago. We still pray the same way from 10 years ago. We still do all the same things that we did 10 years ago because we're just trying to maintain that same feeling from that same space. Well, never mind what God did 10 years ago. Let's know him and feel him and experience him today. Today. Uh, and it's so easy to fall into the trap of, you know, I think his church, you know, prayer and discipleship and mission, they start as these vital and exciting things that overflow from being in the fountain. But when we separate ourselves from the fountain, then all of a sudden prayer becomes a job description and a meeting. Discipleship becomes a job description and a meeting. Worship becomes a job description and a meeting. And it's like we have to build all of this scaffolding to kind of hold it all in place and make it look like the church is still alive when actually it's not at all. It's just an empty structure of scaffolding. And do you know what, guys? Building scaffolding without the fire of God is also exhausting and tiring and leads to burnout. And there are some of you, I'm guessing, because I, I put myself in both categories. I think at times I think I'm both the younger son and the older son, and both at the same time. But, but yeah, I know that feeling, you know, trying so hard to put the scaffolding up and put the scaffolding up. And all the time, we need to return to a vital relationship with the Lord. You know, the psalmist says, doesn't he, sing a new song to the Lord. What would it look like to recapture that today, you know? Otherwise, we end up like the older son. The older son is stood outside of the party, complaining about the party. And I've ended up in that situation myself where actually God is moving somewhere else. And instead of me thinking, oh, this is amazing. The father's heart is over here. Let's go and join in the party. I'm like, can you believe what these people are doing? <laughs> and we complain about it because we've, we've, we've failed to keep in step with what the Holy Spirit is actually doing today. So two types of crisis. We either move too fast and we run ahead of what God is doing. We try to bring the kingdom into the now by our own strength. Or we fail to keep up and our relationship with him goes cold. And we fail to keep in step with the spirit. We have to be into the, in the place where we're standing in the fountain. We're walking in step with him. And we're joined with him in that vital relationship. And so that's what the younger son realizes. 
And so he's, he, in his crisis moment, turns back. We don't know what happens to the older son because Jesus finishes the story before we get a chance to see what the older son does, which is quite profound. He just leaves it hanging. But with the younger son, we see that he decides that he's going to go back. So he thinks, oh, it's payback time. The only way that I'm going to get back to being with my father is if I go back as a slave and then I can earn my way back into his affections and be with him again. Now, We know theologically that's not the case. Grace, forgiveness, we know. But don't you do that in your own life? Or is it just me? You know, I think if I've got an important meeting or or something that I think I really need the Lord to bless this, I'm like, right, I better make sure in the morning, quiet time, you know, I'll confess my sins. Maybe I'll fast, I'll skip breakfast. And, And I think if I do all of these things, then God will bless me. Surely he'll bless me. But I totally forget that actually we don't do our quiet time with the Lord in order for him to bless us. Our quiet time with the Lord is the blessing. What's wrong with us? Restless hearts find their rest in him. We do our quiet time. We do those things because they are the blessing. Not in order to obtain the blessing. That's still making the same mistake of elevating gifts above giver it's all about the giver we seek him first oh yeah just seeing the sarah j make a comment seek first the kingdom of god yes seek first the kingdom of god and all these things will be added to you we seek him first right we come to him as we are and i love this so i'm going to read verse 20 again because it's just so beautiful okay verse 20 uh, if i can find it where's it gone verse Verse, verse 20, so, so the younger son, he gets up and goes to his father, but while he was still a long way off, and remember he's coming back to think he's going to earn his way back into the affections of the father, but whilst he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion because he still loves him. Do you remember how he left? He left and the father was knowing he had no other choice but to let him go so this relationship could have the possibility of being restored. So he's filled with compassion for him. And he ran to kiss his son. Jewish patriarchs never, ever run. We don't understand this, but this was just not done in that context by Jewish men. But this father, he does not care. He runs to the son. He runs to the son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. And the son comes back and he's got the mental scars, he's got the physical scars, he's got his clothes over in rags, he's been feeding the pigs. He probably stinks of pig poo, right? <laughs> Remember the Jewish context, that's awful. It's full of shame. He comes back and his shame is not just something that's internalized, but it's actually present on his body. You can see it. You can see it in his, on his skin, on his clothes, on his facial expression, on his scars. He comes back in the most broken of broken people. And the father doesn't just accept him as he is. This is so important. He doesn't just accept him as he is, but he also does not leave him as he is. Do you see that in the story? He comes in, in that, in that moment, The father accepts him, but he doesn't leave him as he is. He gives him, firstly, he gives him a robe for his back to cover that old identity and that old way of life that's filled him with shame. And he says, here you are, have the clothes of the father. Have the clothes of the father, a new identity for you so that you don't look the same anymore. And then as the son comes in, it's like he's lost in life. He doesn't know what direction he's going in. He's lost meaning. He's lost a sense of purpose in his life. And the father says, here, have some sandals for your feet. Because you're going to be walking to new places. You're going to be called on new missions. You're going to be doing new things with your life now because you've got a new purpose. Now you're back with me in relationship. And then finally, uh, the other thing he gives him, this, the most amazing thing he saves for last, he also gives him a ring for his finger, and that ring is the signet ring, the ring of authority that the father would have used to stamp like legal documents, wax seal them with his ring as a sign of his authority. So lastly, the father gives him an authority for the son to be able to deal with his shame and temptations and with those voices in his head that tell him he's not good enough, the the father gives him the the seal of authority, the authority of the Holy Spirit in his life to overcome those things. But that's not even the best thing. Not only does he give him 
the, 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 the shoes of a new mission, the cloak of a new identity, the ring of a new authority. But the father then, what does he do next? He fe- kills the fattened calf. He throws a massive party, a massive celebration. They dance around like little kids. The music is blaring. They have an amazing time together. As John Wesley said on his deathbed, the best thing of all is God with us. <laughs> and that's the best thing of all. The son is now back in this amazing time, this amazing relationship with his father. They're just celebrating. And, have a, and it's like old days, you know, it's like those times back in the childhood when they were camping and fishing and everything was well. He's back in that moment, back in that space. Like last week, well, actually this week has been, a, for multiple reasons, this week has been a bit of a difficult week. The week before, though, I had an awesome week. And um, the week before is when we kind of announced we're going to do a, you know, a month of prayer for the month of lockdown. And I spent, I just kind of like, you know, made some time in my diary, some space to just pray for people. And I prayed for quite a lot of people in church. Some of you have prayed for, uh, asked for prayer requests and prayed for you. And, as, and it sounds very holy and righteous and like an amazing person. I'm really not. Um, but, uh, for, you know, I'm, I just made the effort to do it. And, and partly selfishly, but not, I do love you guys, but I'm doing it for myself as well. Because I tell you what, when I was in that moment and I was just praying for, for you guys and I was with the Father, it was like, oh man, for a moment, I was like, that week I went to the party. Do you know what I mean? This week has been more difficult. I've tried to be a younger son, do it on my own strength. Last week, I went to the party. And it was just me and him, and, you know, I was praying to God, and I felt him, you know, I was quiet enough to shut up for a moment to, to hear him speaking back to me. And I was just there with a notepad and pen and just writing stuff down and being like, oh, thank you, Lord. And I, it's just amazing. I went to the party. I'm like, why can I not do that more often? Why can we not do that more often? He's waiting for us at the gate, watching for us to see when we're going to come back. So he can embrace us, so he can give us the feet of a new mission, the cloak of a new identity, the ring of a new authority, and so he can throw a party with us. He's waiting there. You know, so many people think that God is judgmental and unkind and malicious. No, no, no. This is what God is like. And as for the older son, well, after a while, as the party is, you know, the celebration is going on and and the party is raging and roaring. But after a while, the father notices that something is missing. And so he goes outside and he finds the older son there in his dead religion, who's turned off and cold and stuck in the same ways and just doing traditions and routines. And what does the father do to the older son? Well, Jesus says he pleads with him to come back into the party. It's like, son, I still want you. I'm celebrating my other son, but I still want you. I still want you. Please come back into the party so that we can celebrate with each other. You know, I, I think that as you read this story, like you suddenly realize that the prodigal son is actually not a very good title for it. Like, partly because it's about two sons. So it could be called the parable of the two sons. But actually, I agree with Tim Keller. Tim Keller says this shouldn't be called the parable of the prodigal son. It should be called the parable of the prodigal God. Prodigal meaning to recklessly spend everything. Because the one that recklessly spends everything is not the younger son. The one that recklessly spends everything is the father. He pours his love out on these two sons. And that is the message that I want you to hear this morning. Is that no matter where you are in life right now, no matter what is happening in life right now, whether you're lost in the, in the sense in which is obvious to everybody around you, or whether you're lost in the sense where it's just obvious in you and it's in your mind and you feel desperate and burnt out and exhausted, in our moment of desperation, God meets us there because he loves us, because he loves you. And this morning, you're watching this message, not, f- f- you know, not by accident. You're watching this message because he is, as he always is, all the time, standing at the gates, pleading with you outside of the party, waiting for you to come home, pleading for you to come back in, saying, come back in, come to the source of the fountain, stop elevating gifts above giver. The gifts will come. Don't worry about the gifts. They're on their way. Just come back to the giver. That's what counts, and the blessings follow. Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. So guys, I just want you to know, look, if you are lost, 
trying to do stuff on your own, he loves you. If, if you've been propping up your faith on dead religion, just it's been scaffolding, he loves you, right? If, if, you, if you are at that moment where you feel like you are covered in pig poo, and like you're, you're unlovable, and you're ashamed, and no one's going to accept you, and have you, and want you, he loves you, right? If you feel totally unworthy, he loves you. If you are the person who turns up to the prayer meeting week in, week out, and that was the only time that you ever pray is in that prayer meeting just to impress people so it looks like you're praying, he knows and he still loves you and he's pleading for you to come back into the party. If you're the person that complains all the time about stuff that God is doing somewhere else, he still loves you. If you're the person that's like damaging other people or damaging the church, he still loves you doesn't matter what you've done, where you've been, how you've walked, what you've experienced, how you've turned your back on him and walked away from him. Do you get it? He still loves you. He still loves you. And he wants to welcome you in so that one day we will be in that space where we will rule and reign with him in the garden, where we'll walk with him, and he will say, behold, I'm making all things new. And the streets will be paved with gold. And everything that you've tried to buy on Amazon will will just pale into insignificance because you'll have so much more. And that day is coming. I know it's not here yet. I know we're desperate for it. I know that we long for it. But he will bring it about. We have to wait and be patient. And rest in him until it comes. And I think that right now, we are in this moment of crisis, aren't we? We're in the midst of a pandemic. Racial tensions are higher than, I don't know, left and right. There's so many things going on at the moment, aren't there? The climate change crisis. We've got the political crisis. We've got racial crisis. We've got health crisis. You name it, we've got it. Crisis. I know that Christy said this last week, I said it a couple of weeks before that as well, but could this be the moment where we're having our wake-up call moment and God is saying, come back in to the party. You've tried doing it on your own, it's not worked. Come back to the fountain, come back to the source, come back and drink of me. Restless hearts find their rest in him. So I'm going to pray now for us. And um, I'm just going to say uh, as well, I mean, if you want to respond as I'm praying, um, I think my iPad's run out of battery, so I can't really see what you're, the comments at all now. But if you, if, as I'm praying, if you want to respond by saying, I want to come to the party, then I think that there is a party emoji in Facebook. And so maybe if someone can copy and pe- put that into the comments, you can copy and paste it just as a way of responding of saying, actually, this morning, y- y- you know, I want to come back into the party. I, I-, I want to know you. I'm going to pray now. And if you feel like that is you and you want to accept that invitation that the Lord is putting out to you this morning to say, come back into the party, then copy and paste that emoji. And just, you know, as a public declaration of saying, Lord, this morning, I hear your voice calling me from the gate at the end of the driveway. Lord, I hear your voice calling from outside of the party, inviting me back in, and I'm willing to come. So let me just pray. Father, Father, I thank you so much that you are waiting for us, that you're listening for our footsteps on the driveway, Father, to welcome us home. Lord, I thank you. I praise you. Lord, I just ask now that for those of you that are just sending in emojis to say, yeah, I want in, I want to know you, I want to be with you. Lord, I just pray for them, Lord, that right now you would assure them, Father, that yeah, if, 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 if they come back home to you, Father, in this moment, that Lord, you'll give them that robe, that ring, that cloak, and you'll be with them. And that, Lord, you will never, ever reject us for what it is that we may have done in our past for our shame and regret. So, Lord, I just pray now, Father, would your Holy Spirit come and meet people? Thank you, Lord. And just reassure them, Father, that the party is real. 
and now and not yet. The best is yet to come. Yeah, Lord, I thank you. So, Father, we offer ourselves up to you now once again and just pray. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen.